go through the book of Revelation. Uh, we've been going at a pretty good clip. Lately, we covered all of 15 in one chapter. That was easy to do in a chapter. Uh, chapter 16, we've covered several verses already. We're slowing down just a little bit right here because it gets really crazy. Uh, I want to look at the fourth and fifth seal. We looked at the fourth seal, verses 8 and 9, last week, so I won't say much about them, but we'll be looking at verses 10 and 11. Uh, it worked out. I was kind of, I try to be one of those pastors that's not gone a lot, you know. Sometimes you get, uh, depending on your ministry and so forth, you get invites to speak, and we just uh, did a sermon conference a uh, little bit back, just a couple weeks back in uh, Canada, which went good a few weeks ago. And I had an Orlando teen summit that I was supposed to speak at at a, at, a, at a black fellowship in Orlando. I was looking forward to, but that's being rescheduled. So I was able to be here today, which is awesome, because I was like, Lord, I don't want to lose too much continuity with the book of Revelation, because we've we got a good pace going, you know, Amen. and I'm glad we're back in it. So in verse 8, we read, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat and they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory now catch the scene these are people these aren't these nice old ladies that want to do what's right and follow God and so forth these are people that are blaspheming God these are people that have rejected the gospel have, re have rejoiced over the two witnesses being killed have sent each other gifts that God's voice is being stifled uh, that the, the, the glorious gospel was preached to an angel they rejected it they took the mark of the beast when God had another angel said not to take the mark or you'll be doomed forever they took it anyway uh, and these are God haters and uh, now you know what <laughs> Fierce heat, and we talked about, you know, what this could be. It could be solar flares from the sun, uh, which happen in cycles, or it could actually be a, uh, a mini supernova that would be uh, supernaturally uh, governed. Uh, supernovas, when they take place, a star literally just gets hotter and hotter and burns out, and literally then it becomes darkness. And this would have to be a supernaturally, I believe, intended uh, judgment, which would show you why God's involved with the bull if it was something like that. It may be more likely that it's simply solar flares, you know, fire flicking off the sun closer and closer to the earth and what have you. But what's interesting is just like a supernova, there's an intense burst of heat for a time, and then there's darkness. In fact, look at the fifth seal, or fifth uh, bowl, I should say. Then the uh, fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. So now you have this darkness, and they nod their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. They refused to repent. Now, this is very interesting because you have to keep in mind what time it is on the prophetic clock right here. What happens first, the seals, the trumpets, or the bowls? You have first the what judgment? The seals which lead into the trumpets which lead into the bowls. And the bowls are called the last of the wrath of God. So it's at the, near the very, very end. This could be even, you know, weeks or so uh, before uh, the second coming of Christ, before Armageddon. We don't know exactly because it doesn't pinpoint the specific time. But we know it's very late in uh, this, the tribulation period. It's after the mark of the beast has been issued, and the angel said, warn not to take it. And so people have pretty much, you know, they've sealed their fate already. And, and God is beginning to show the severest of judgments at this point. Now, as we look at this and we see what's going on here, uh, we have this great darkness. Now, uh, when we consider this, it's important to pick some of this apart, see what we can... Uh, garner here if you look at uh, verse 10 a little more closely then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the what on the throne of the beast on the throne of the beast the beast is the antichrist the bible warns not to take the mark of the beast which is the number of his name or the number of his name and the number of his name is 666 it's a number of a man the beast is a man uh he's called the antichrist in scripture john said you have heard that uh, the Antichrist is coming, singular, even now many are in the world. So he's the embodiment of evil, possessed by satanic power. 
It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, he comes with all power and signs and lying wonders and all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish after the working, it says, of Satan. So this guy is empowered by Satan. In fact, this plague, this bowl, is poured out on the throne of the beast. And if you look back at Revelation 13, let's go there, you see this throne is mentioned one other time. And we read in verse 2, of chapter 13 and the beast which I saw was like a leopard and Revelation 13 2 and the beast which I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion and the dragon who's the dragon according to Revelation 12 verses 9 through it's Satan right the dragon which is Satan gave him his what power and his what his throne and great authority so Satan's power will be centralized through this man and he'll give his throne to the beast. He'll be offered Satan's authority over the wicked nations that have been rejecting God. In fact, you know Jesus was basically offered that? Go back to Luke chapter 4 in the, in the scripture. Luke chapter 4. And when you get to Luke 4, I want you to go ahead and uh, look at verse 6. This is when Jesus went into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit uh, to be tested by the devil. Uh, and it's interesting because Adam, the first Adam, was tested in the garden where he had everything and he blew it big time. Jesus is tested in the, wil test in the wilderness and he succeeds big time. And in Luke chapter 4, one of the temptations, it says in verse 6, And the devil said to him, well, back up to verse I'm sorry, verse 4. I'm at verse 6 already. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall not live uh, on bread alone. Then in verse 5, and he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a what? In a moment of time. I mean, he gave him, now that couldn't happen back in those days that, as far as like through television, right? But today it can, right? You can see all kinds of things in a moment of time, amen? Satan already had this going this ability back then, through a vision. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time. A vision of all these kingdoms. He probably showed him, you know, the glorious things about these kingdoms. And he said in verse 6, And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been grant handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. So Satan has power over the nations. In fact, when you read Scripture and you go, now God's ultimately in charge, amen? But he allows people to, the Bible says you become enslaved to whatever you submit to. So the masses have rejected God. They submit to satanic powers. Therefore, he's called the, by Jesus called him three times the ruler of this world. He's called in, second, in Ephesians chapter 2, the prince and the power of the air. Okay? He's got a lot of power. And the Scriptures tell us, uh, like for instance, the prince of Persia, was the one that was ruling the king in Persia, which is modern-day Iran. It was a high powerful, a powerful demon, you know. And it talks about the prince of Greece. These are powerful entities because we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness in this world, spiritual weakness in high places. So there are satanic powers that empower world leaders. We have an interesting world leader right now. Just lit up the White House with a, with a, a, a gay symbol and said, love wins, you know, interesting. But these powers, these satanic powers, use leaders. It doesn't mean that God can't ever use a leader. And even when Satan tries to use leaders, God always, God always checkmates Satan in the end, right? So, you know, God only allows Satan to exist for a period of time and is ultimately in control. But... What's interesting here is Satan is, it does have power over the kings of the earth that reject God, and they will coalesce into a new world order where nations will give their power to the Antichrist in the end, and Christians will be systematically uh, exterminated. Many Christians will still, you know, uh, flee and be protected during that time, and others will be put to death. And it'll be a crazy time, but thank God, look what happens in verse 8. Verse 7, therefore, if you worship... Uh, if you worship before me, Satan says, it shall all be yours. Satan wants to be worshipped. Verse 8, Jesus answered, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Okay, Matthew shows us that Jesus also said at that point, get behind me, Satan. 
and Satan fled. Now, aren't you glad that Jesus did not bow the knee to Satan? Amen? Because guess what? He, he would seem to get power over the nations that Satan had, but who would be ruling over him? Satan. That would have been a shortcut to what Jesus already had coming. You see, Jesus rescues us, it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 through 13, from the kingdom of darkness, amen? And we're translated into the kingdom of light, amen? But Jesus had to go to the cross to save us from our sins, save us from the wrath of God that we deserve because of our rebellion. And also it says he delivered us from the power of Satan, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. It says that he delivered those who lived in the fear of death all their lives. And it says he delivered us from the power of Satan. But to get us and redeem us from the nations, he had to go to the cross. And what Satan tried to do is give him a shortcut, you see. And Satan offers shortcuts, but they involve compromise. And in the end, Satan wins. If you play, if, when Satan plays chess with a God, he always loses. But when you play chess with the devil... You lose. In fact, the church was very, very powerful. The first three centuries of church history, the world was being turned upside down. People were coming to Christ all over the place, left and right. In fact, the Romans were blown away. We have history. We have the history. The Romans ruled the world. But they were blown away because they would put their babies on walls to just let them die. And they would just die on these walls, this one particular wall. Christians would rescue their babies. They would take their sick and infirmed and throw them out on the streets to die. Christians would take them in. Because God gave us a heart of love. We saw who God is. We saw for God so loved the world. We saw the scripture say God is love. And Christians stood out. And I even have a, a writing, an ancient writing from a, 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 a Roman uh, official writing to another Roman leader talking about how these Christians make us look bad because they have far more compassion on our native people than we ourselves do. And that's how we ought to stand out today. You and I ought to stand out in our community as people that care about others, about people that love others. Amen? You should be known at your work as someone who goes the extra mile. You should be known at your work when they think of somebody who works hard at your work, they should be able, you should be at least one of the people they think about. When they, when they think at your work of somebody who has integrity, who keeps their word, who's honest, they shouldn't be thinking of any, you know, any mo. They should be thinking of, you should come to their attention. Well, that guy's really honest. When they think of a person who is not hypocritical, but walks their talk and shines a light, they should be able to think of you. And if you say, man, I wish they could, but I blew it back here one time at my work. Well, you know, did you repent? Create a new legacy at work. Let them see who you can be in Jesus, amen? And shine the light of Jesus and be a blessing, amen? So we were called to be a blessing and an encouragement. Well, Jesus didn't take a shortcut. But for the first three centuries of church history, the church rejected paganism. In fact, a lot of the writings in the early church that we read by Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and what have you, the early church fathers, the disciples of the disciples or their disciples and so on, there was wave upon wave of infiltration by the pagans and the Gnostics and, you know, philosophy and so forth. They continued to reject. And they shined. They continued to cave into the persecutions. They had ten waves of persecution by the emperors, most of them quite deadly. And they continue to shine. But guess what? In the 4th century, beginning in 312, under the Roman Emperor Constantine, who I believe basically reasoned, we can't beat these Christians, man. Let's join them. Let's make the empire a Christian empire. His mother claimed to be Christian. So he claimed to have a vision of a cross and, and that said, in this sign, conquer, you see. Are we called to go conquer the world physically for Jesus? No. We witness, we share the gospel. If they reject Christ, they don't want him, it says wipe the dust off your feet, go to the next person. But love people, amen? Even with false teachers, it says that we're supposed to try to win them gently, you know? Not burn them at the stake. And it's interesting because the early church, 
said, no, no, no. Constantine said, hey, I'm going to make Christianity, you know, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And at that point, Roman Catholicism was birthed. What happened was a wedding between paganism and Christianity. And many of the temples for false gods, and people were still worshiping their false gods too, by the way. By the way, we know that Constantine was still a pagan at heart. In fact, he's, he wouldn't be baptized, refused. He says, I'm going to wait till I'm on my deathbed. <laughs> then I'll get baptized. Because, you know, that way I won't fall away afterwards. You know? And he continued to have coins made for the false gods of Rome and tributes to these false gods. So it was a sham. It's like if Obama made Christianity the state religion of the USA and we followed his other beliefs too. And we called that Christianity. So what happened is Christians, instead of trying to win people in the world to Christ, just as Jesus, Satan tried to get Jesus to bow down and get the kingdoms, and he said no. In the opposite way, the world said to the church, hey, bow down to the state and follow the state and let it interpret what you should believe. And Because Constantine started working with the, the uh, Christian leaders and so forth, and they started having different church councils and defined what Christianity should be. The state did. And that's, that's the history of early Catholicism. And then you get all kinds of teachings that came down the pike through the years that were added. Purgatory, you know, worshiping, uh, you know, or praying, I should say, to saints and, and praying to dead people. People have died, which the Bible forbids. And, you know, and, you know on and on and on. Not to get into the whole history of Catholicism. But I'm saying we have to watch out for compromise in our lives. The enemy comes to us and wants to offer us shortcuts, you know. How many found a lot of times shortcuts backfire? That, you know, you, get, you see the advertisements and you're like, man, that didn't work. Well, I blew my money again, you know. Well, you want to make sure one way you do not want to take a shortcut is in following God. You want to do it His way, amen? And sincerely put Christ first. This is, this is so huge, so important. Now, thank God Jesus did bow down. But what's crazy in the end, and it's, it's in a good way, is according to Revelation 11, at the seventh trumpet, and I told you before, the sixth seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl all revealed the same ending at the very end of the age. Just diagram those three judgments. But guess what? In Revelation 11, the seventh trumpet blows. The last trumpet, Paul said, we'd be changed at the last trumpet. It shows that Christ comes and he rewards his saints and so forth. And it says the kingdoms of this world became the kingdom of Christ. All those kingdoms that Satan added, guess what? They become the kingdom of Christ in the end because he gets the victory through his cross who died for our sins, amen. He's already the rightful judge of the nations. Even before he went to the cross, God could just wiped out all the nations. But Satan had them captive. But God wanted to win us out of Satan's domain and, and, and spare us from the judgment we deserve. So God became a man in a substitutionary, vicarious atonement, died in our place to pay for our sins. So what an awesome truth that is. Now go back to Revelation chapter 16, which is where we're studying. And in Revelation 16... We're talking about Satan's throne. Verse 2 of chapter 13 is given to the beast. But now darkness comes on the throne of the beast. Darkness comes on the throne of the beast. By the way, it's interesting. It's contrasted with the throne of heaven. Look at verse 17, a few verses later. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the what? throne saying it is done just a little bit later man whose throne is victorious it's done meaning satan's throne is destroyed at this point antichrist is destroyed the seventh bowl uh harmonizes with as i said the sixth seal and i'm sorry and uh, the uh, seventh trumpet but it's armageddon it's christ coming right there boom god god speaks it is done so Satan's throne, keep in mind is limited it's important for us to understand this because people will get all caught up in satan's power it, they'll say, it says the world will be saying of the Antichrist, who can make war with him? And check this guy out, man. He's wiping everybody out. And then the mark comes out. Okay, let me take the mark. It's so important that you understand that Satan's power is limited. He only reigns, which this is a joke about it, guys. It's a powerful, it's a powerful reign that he has. I don't joke about how powerful and intense it is, but the time, the timing. He only rules for 42 months. That's one of the shortest, that's even less than... A one-term president. You know what I'm saying? It's a very short reign. 
And the sad thing is that so many people are going to put their stock in him, and they're going to say, hey, I'm betting on him, you know. And Christ will come and defeat him at Armageddon. So it's important that we understand this. Now, there's an interesting parallel here, because what happens to his, when you look at the fifth seal, or fifth uh, bowl, look at verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of pain now remember when we studied as we're studying through the bowl judgments how many of them parallel the judgments in egypt remember when god's people were held captive for 400 plus years by pharaoh and moses led him the exodus but you remember when god used moses and aaron to bring forth the 10 plagues and you remember last time we got together on this and we looked at revelation 16 we saw a lot of parallels water being turned to blood in Revelation 16. Boils, sores from, for those who took the mark of the beast. Remember that? There are all these parallels. Well, here's another parallel. Do you remember what happened under the ninth plague in Egypt? Darkness came on Pharaoh's kingdom. In fact, let's go to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10, way back in the Old Testament, the second book of the Old Testament, right after uh, Genesis. Exodus chapter 10. And what's and by the way, if you're visiting, praise God. We're glad you're here. And if you have a Bible, great. If you don't, there might be one under you. You can use uh, the one with someone sitting next to you if you want. Uh, but we love to bring our Bibles. And we're a church where we actually study the Bible. Can you believe it? We actually look back and forth in the Scriptures, see what the Scriptures say. We believe God wants us to do that. We believe that's very important. And that way, uh, and, and you'll get blessed by doing it. You know, you'll, get, you'll, be, you'll start to know where your books are. Somebody was telling me, wow, somebody was like, visiting they were like oh man how do you get so fast to those books he goes i've been here a while you know and you just you get used to it you know and and that should be happening in our daily life too god help us all to study the scriptures more but here in exodus 10 because the bible says study to show yourself approved amen a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightfully dividing the word of truth so as we check out exodus chapter 10 go ahead and pick it up at verse uh 21 exodus 10 verse 21 it says then the lord said to moses stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of egypt even a darkness which may be felt now isn't that interesting even a darkness that may be what may be felt you know interesting i remember augustine's you know what is darkness and this whole concept that you know well darkness is the absence of light it's really not anything which is an interesting philosophical concept. And there's some truth to that, but it's not the whole truth. Here we see that, that darkness actually is something. And this is a darkness that can actually be felt. Isn't that interesting? A darkness that can be felt. Verse 22, So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. I love verse 23, the second part of it. Look, listen to this. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. That's how dark it was. Couldn't even get up. It's a darkness where you can't see anything an inch, two inches, a foot in front of you, and you can't even get up because it's so terrifying, and you're feeling the darkness. That's crazy. But look at the end of verse 23. But all the sons of Israel had what? Light in their dwellings. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? How many times do I tell you, watch out for those who say if you go through the tribulation as a Christian, you'll have to suffer God's wrath. The parallels to Exodus are alarming because just as in Exodus, the, uh, we, we see that the Israelites, God's people, didn't suffer wrath. And God says we're not appointed to wrath, amen. And when we go through the tribulation period, when the church goes through the tribulation, we will not suffer God's wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. He's selective. In fact, when we read Revelation chapter 16, where does the darkness fall upon? Christians, does it say? No, on whose throne? The kingdom of the beast. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Verse 24. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore our livestock too shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we shall take uh, some of them to serve the Lord, our God. 
And until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know uh, with what we shall serve the Lord. Verse 27, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me, beware, do not see my face again, for in the day that you see my face you shall die. Moses said, you're right, I shall never see your face again. And that's because after that would come the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, and the children of uh, Yahweh would go into the, toward the promised land and go through the Red Sea, and God would destroy the Egyptian armies. Amen? Pretty heavy what's going on here. Pretty, pretty amazing. Now, uh, like I said, it arrests my attention when I see darkness that can be felt. And this is a parallel of what's happening at the end. And I believe it's a darkness that can be felt at the end, too. And I, and I think, I believe we could prove that from Scripture. Uh, not just because of the parallel. I don't believe that's enough to say since it happened there, you could feel it. It's definitely going to be that way in the end. I believe it's in the text itself. But before I go there, I want you to understand that the Bible tells us that the world will become increasingly dark, both spiritually and physically, okay? The Apostle Paul said in the last days, perilous times will come. And a little bit later in the same chapter, in 2 Timothy 3, he said, wicked men will proceed and seducers will proceed from bad to worse. Jesus said it would be like the birth pains of a woman and lawlessness would increase and the love of the many, in the Greek it's the many, ho, many, definite article there, the love of the majority will grow cold. Love of the many will grow cold. So spiritually speaking, the world's to get darker and darker. And we have to be on guard at that time. Because it's in the context of those verses that I just quoted from Jesus that he said many would fall away. See to it, he said, that you're not frightened. The end is not yet. It's in the light of those verses that Jesus says, he that endures the end will be saved. It's in light of those passages in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, and also Matthew 25, the Olivet Discourse, that Jesus talks about our hearts not being overwhelmed with the cares of this world and, and by drunkenness and these kinds of things. So we can stand before the Son of Man. So we can escape all those pitfalls that take place in the tribulation and stand before the Son of Man when He comes at the end of the tribulation. We have to guard our hearts. We need to guard our hearts even now, amen? Are you guarding your hearts, you know? The Bible says guard your hearts because with all diligence, I mean, you should be diligent like a watchman watches over a city. You should be guarding your heart with all diligence, it says, because out of your heart come the issues or the springs of life. And the Bible says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up in your heart that can defile many. So you need to make sure you're watching your heart and that you don't have unforgiveness, malice, evil, bitterness in there toward other people where Satan gets to you because out of the heart Jesus says the mouth speaks and then Satan begins to use your tongue and the devil starts controlling your tongue tearing down the work of God and things that God is doing or tearing down other people you got to be very 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 careful because the Bible says we're not to be partakers of their wickedness he says so we won't partake of the wrath of God the Bible does warn us that we can go back even as the prodigal son left his father we can turn away. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, it talks about a certain servant. And it, Jesus said how blessed the servant would be that gives out meat in due season and how he'd be blessed at his return. But Jesus said, if that servant, the same one that would be blessed when Jesus comes back, says in his heart, oh, my Lord's not coming for some time. He delays his coming and begins to beat the maidservants and get drunk with the drunkards. The Lord will come at a time when he's not ready and will cut him in pieces. Ooh, man. And put him with the unbelievers. So he warns servants of Christ that that servant, that godly servant, so much for once you're saved, you're always saved. So much for, well, you'll persevere to the end no matter what. No, Jesus said, may will fall away. He that endures the end will be saved. And he says, that good servant, that good and faithful servant, he calls him. If that good and faithful servant, that servant, becomes wicked, the Lord will come back in a time when he's not ready. And he'll be cut in pieces and thrown with the unbelievers. Where do the unbelievers go? Revelation 21.8, but the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers. And he also says not only just unbelieving, but the cowardly. 
those who renounce their faith, and so forth, their part will be in the lake of fire. So as Christians, hey, I just preach what the word preaches even when it's not popular. What I'm saying right now is not popular. Joe, when people come in, you, man, you, you know, you, you want just not to offend anybody. That way the church gets really, really, really big. That's not Jesus' church. If you're trying not to offend people, to attract people, it's not Jesus' church because we're called to preach the whole counsel of God. And Paul said, consider therefore the goodness and the severity of God. We need to realize this is serious stuff here. God gets really serious here. And he warns believers in the midst of this falling away, make sure we watch our hearts so we don't fall away, amen? So our hearts are not hardened. And you know, you could fall away and be sitting here today and be falling away because you got your church clothes on or whatever and, and you got your church face on, but inwardly your heart is wicked and you have envy and strife and wickedness and against other brothers or uh, other people. The Bible says, how can... The Bible says, no, in 1 John, no murderer has eternal life in him. And the Bible says, if you hate your brother, you're in darkness until now. You're not really embracing, you're not really following Jesus. So make sure your heart's right, amen? Make sure Jesus is first. And make sure your love is not growing cold. And it's going to be harder, I'm warning you. It's going to be harder and harder because sin will abound more and more, the Bible says. And lawlessness will increase, and when it says lawlessness increases, the love of many grows cold. Because people become so wicked, it's be a lot harder to love people. But thankfully, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Amen? God gives greater grace to overcome that. Amen? So you can say, God, I need greater grace. I can't love people on my own. I can't be forgiving and merciful on my own. I can only do it as you live through me. See, the Bible, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do what? What's that mean? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, amen? But it says through him we can do what? All things. So you and I need to rely on Jesus daily, amen? We need to go to him constantly and say, Lord, help me to love more. Help me to have the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. First thing listed, amen? Peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. I want all those things in my life. I dare not come up here, and I never have, by the grace of God, without crying out to God first. And I try to do it often before I get up here. And, but really, before we do anything, we should be crying out to God, amen? Before you get up in the morning, it's not that difficult to say, Lord, help me. Even if it's a short little prayer, say something, say, God, be with me. God, strengthen me. God, give me divine appointments. God, use me to your glory, Amen. God, help me saturate me with your love and, and help me to be a bold witness for Jesus because it's going to get worse. And you know what? It's not going to get just darker spiritually, but it's going to get darker physically as God's judgments come against the spiritual darkness on this planet. How do I know that? Because even before you get to the fifth bowl, when you look at the fourth trumpet, look at Revelation chapter 9. Revelation 9. The first couple of verses, and look what happens under the fourth trumpet. I'm sorry, the fifth, uh, back up to chapter 8 for the fourth trumpet. I'll also look at chapter 9, but I want to look at this one first. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded, that's the fourth trumpet, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. So even before the bowls come, it's starting to get dark. That's God warning them that he's withdrawing. Okay, you don't want me? You don't want my love and my light and my truth? You want to use up all my resources I've given you on earth, but to live wickedly? Well, I'm withdrawing a bunch of the light, a third of it, boom. That's a warning. Now the Bible says God brings his judgments among the nations so they'll learn so they'll learn righteousness. So they'll turn. So they'll repent. So he makes it somewhat dark, saying, hey, huh, you need to cry out to me. Of course, NASA, if it's still around then, which it probably will be, and all these other outfits will be saying, well, there's a scientific explanation to this, you know. But then it'll get even darker. Chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven, which had fallen 
to the earth, and the key to the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were what? Darkened by the smoke of the pit. You ever see a fire? And what happens to the sun and the moon when there's a lot of smoke? Smoke turns, you know, sun will turn red. If it was really intense, you wouldn't even see it. Moon will turn blood red. So it's fourth trumpet, dark. Third. Fifth trumpet, even darker. By the time you get to the fifth bowl, what happens? It gets totally dark. Total, total blackout. Incredibly dark. And by the way, it's important for us to understand. Why did God judge? Why did he judge the Egyptians with regard to darkness? Think about it. Who was the main false idol god that the Egyptians worshipped? Ra. Ra was the what god? The sun god. And I, when we went through Exodus before, I pointed out that these different judgments that God brings are judgments on the false gods they worship, showing them that they weren't really gods at all. The Bible says the gods of the nation, and he's speaking of the Egyptians there, too, are demons. So the sun's not a demon, but they worship Horus. Ra was a no-name for Horus. They worship Horus, or Ra. Instead of the creator, they worship the creation. By the way, that's the lie, you know that? To worship the creation rather than the creator is, is the lie, a big part of the lie. In fact, in, in Genesis, the first few chapters, what does Satan try to get Eve to do? Reject God and her worship of him, partake of the forbidden fruit, so she can become what? God. To worship the creature, she would become God. Satan himself, before that, wanted to be like the what? Most high God. Isn't that right? The Antichrist, it say he'll sit in the temple showing himself that he is what? God. But thinking, and it says that the world's given a strong delusion that they may believe the lie. What lie? Worshiping creation rather than creator. In fact, when you look at Romans 1, in Romans 1, it says they rejected the creator, Right? And it says, and they worshiped the creation instead of the creator and believed the lie. Woo! And right there, you know what it says in the Greek? Does everybody have to go to the bathroom all of a sudden? It's like a massive exodus, you know? Of course, I say it when my son's walking out because I don't want to pick on anybody else, but <laughs> he'll be back in 30 seconds, right, Jojo? Okay. Uh, try to go before the service. You know, and if that's the thing, you know, but if you have a small bladder, understand, no problem. We do have bags, you know. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's interesting. It says in, in Genesis, I'm sorry, in, in Romans 1, that they, they worship the creation instead of the creator and believe the lie. And in the Greek, it's not a lie. This is what's interesting. They believe the lie. Isn't that interesting? And that's what's happened in our country today. We're believing the lie. Everything came out of nothing, you know. Really? And then, you know, uh, I've got quotes from leading Darwinist evolutionists that said, if you're going to worship something, you should worship the creation, the cosmos. Scientists. Crazy. And now guess what? The Egyptians were worshiping the sun. Instead of giving glory to the one who made... The sun, by the way, is just one star out of millions and hundreds of millions and perhaps trillions, they believe. Wow. And it's not even a big sun. It's like a medium-sized sun. And you're going to worship that? And they're worshiping that. But Satan, as I told you before, the Bible says the gods of the nations are demons. Demons use things to get us to worship things instead of the one true God. So God says, blackout. Your sun's gone. Don't look to it for salvation. In fact, do you know why the Lord brought the judgments in Egypt? He brought the judgments in Egypt, it says, so they would know who he was, that he was a true God. Because you can't find salvation in those things. You have to keep in mind, when God brings his judgments, it's to wake people up. That's why I said, I love to quote that scripture. God's judgments, through his judgments that the nations learn righteousness. He wants to wake us up. He wants to get our attention. Because he doesn't want us to go to hell. If you worship the sun and you keep putting your hope in the sun, you're going to go to hell. So he judges them by taking away the sunlight. 
giving them darkness. The sun's not going to help them. They can only be helped if they turn to the Creator who made all things, Yahweh. That's the only way they could be saved. And don't think that God was just working on the Jews. He's bringing judgments. I mean, did God work on the Ninevites through Jonah? Yes, he wanted them too. In fact, Jonah was happy to see them perish because of how wicked they were. Because they stick hooks in people's, in the, in the mouths of women after they slayed the men and they dragged them and their children with hooks to Nineveh. And their, their walls were plastered with, with skeletons of people they killed. If you went to their city walls, you'd see all these skeletons over their walls. They put these huge, uh, you know, tree branches that they made into spears. They'd stick them in the ground and they'd stick you on it like right here in the neck where you slowly go down. I've been in the uh, British Museum and I've seen their pictographs. I've seen uh, their carvings of what they did to people. And you're like, wow, that's why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. But God cared even for them. And then Jesus said, Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And God says in Jeremiah 18 that he'll plan destruction on a nation if it doesn't repent. But if it repents, he'll relent of the destruction he was planning. He'll bring blessing. He said that about all the nations there. So keep in mind, God loves people. He cares about people. And we need to love people, make sure we care about people. And we need to remember that we were once the wicked. We were once without Christ. Aren't you glad Jesus loved you? That he gave himself for you? You have to remember, for God so loved the world. Those who come against the gospel. Paul was Saul, and he came against the gospel. Amen? But God had patience even with him. He was the main threat to the gospel preaching in the early chapter, in the middle of the book of Acts, or I should say the, you know, chapter 9, uh, 10, 11, 12, right in those areas, you start to see, uh, you know, Peter's transition to Paul and Paul's conversion. And Paul told Titus, remember, remember, to remind the congregation that you, we were once wicked too, like them. And the gospel, he said before that, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He said that Jesus gave himself to redeem us. So we preach the love of Christ. We preach the gospel of Christ. But we also preach the holiness of God and, that, and the judgment of God and that it's real. And we have to maintain this biblical tension in the days that we live because there are two extremes, guys. There's a Westboro Baptist extreme, right? Where they say God hates F-A-G-S. And it's a very, 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 very tiny group of people. I said it's funny. I think, I don't know how big they are, 25, 30 people? But they're on the news over and over again. Why do you think Satan puts them on the news over and over again? But he doesn't put the millions of Christians that are on mission trips feeding the poor and rebuilding uh, uh, communities that, that suffered tsunamis like we just did with uh, the Philippines or from earthquakes, which we've been involved in that before as well and will continue to be. They don't show that on the news, do they? So Satan gives a caricature of what the church is. And we need to make sure that we don't play into that caricature, amen? Then there's the other extreme. God just loves everybody, and he wants you to be positive, and, you know, wants you to be happy, and, and it's just positive a couple, ver one or two verses, maybe, you know, just to, you know, but they don't talk about, we need to repent of sin, that unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish, and that we need the blood of Jesus, and then, therefore, you have millions of people being taught a false gospel, who are never told they need to repent, and they end up going to hell. That's just as bad because you're turning people away from Christ either way. You can, now, sometimes it could be your theology. In the case of uh, the Westboro Baptists, they have a, they're strong, you know, five-point Calvinist that God's elected most people for damnation or he's chosen them for damnation or some Calvinists say, well, he didn't choose them for damnation, he just chose them for salvation, but he just passed them by. Same thing. You know, it's the same thing. Come on, let's just be honest. And, and therefore, they believe that God hates most people. And it comes out in the way they preach. We don't believe God hates most people, amen? We believe that God loves everyone, amen? For God so loved the world. Jesus, it says, looked at the rich young ruler that rejected him, and it says he loved him. And he wept over Jerusalem and cried. He said, how often I would gather your children together as a hen does her chicks, but you, I would have, I will, but you were unwilling 
So I'm encouraging this fellowship. I've done it for years. And right now, it's becoming more and more vital that we understand this message that we speak the truth in love. Amen? We speak the truth in love. We walk the truth in love. Amen? So you're dealing with the lost. You remember that you were once there. And you could just as easily be there right now. And it's by the grace of God that we are what we are. Amen? And you have compassion for them. And we pray for them. Because it breaks my heart. I drive down the road sometimes. I see somebody and I can see they're in bad shape. And my heart breaks because I thought, wow, that person, if they, if they just could have Jesus, everything would be changed in their lives. Their whole destiny would be changed overnight. Right at that moment of salvation. And they'd be on the right track. They'd seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he'd add their needs to them and, and bless them. But we have that message, amen? And we need to be sharing that gospel with them. Now, I love verse 23, I said of Exodus, because it says, it says, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Here's another thing you don't want to forget as we study the book of Revelation. Because one of the biggest scare tactics that our pre-trib brethren use to make people think that they're not going to have to be ready to go through the seven-year tribulation. And by the way, if Jesus said we're going through the tribulation, if Paul said we're going through the tribulation, and they warned us to be ready for that time, it's a very serious thing to say, don't worry, you don't really have to be ready to go through it. Because, and I don't want to get into all that because I've done that several times, but many will fall away at that time, Jesus said. And Jesus said, I'm, I'm warning you about these things in advance so you won't fall away. So if you take the warnings away, you're going to be more likely to fall away. That's why we take it very seriously. And that's why you should be here Wednesday night. Okay? You know how much we're charging to see the movie? It's a lot cheaper than Edwards or the Regency. Zero, and you get free snacks. And it's, it's something you'll leave edified. Make sure you're there. But I'll tell you what, important if you can make it great. Important that you and I get this is they try to scare people say, wait a minute, it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, that we're not appointed to the wrath of God. And the tribulation has wrath in it. So since the tribulation has God's wrath in it, we have to be raptured first. Instead of, they're not able to point to any one clear verse that says we get raptured before the tribulation. If they were, we'd be $10,000 poor in this church because we have that $10,000 offer which is featured in our video, which we get into, by the way, in part two. You see, we point out that Thomas Ice, probably the most outspoken, he's Tim LaHaye's right-hand man, co-founder of the Pre-Trib Research Center, challenges on the radio for our $10,000. We talk about our challenge and the $10,000, and, and Tommy Sice takes the challenge and uh, says he has a verse, which I thought was interesting because we played Thomas Ice earlier in the video saying no such verse exists. And then I just requote that after his deal, but I give him a chance. Okay, what's the verse you finally found? Now that there's a $10,000 offer, he's got one. Like, okay, what's your verse? You know what the verse is? You know what Paul says concerning Christ coming out being gathered together to him? And then he warns that that's not going to happen until there's a fallen away first and the Antichrist is revealed. Thomas I says the fallen away is not really the fallen away there. It's really the rapture. I'm not kidding. He says the Greek word apostasia could be understood to be the rapture of the church. But you know, that would totally contradict what Paul's saying. Paul would be then saying, concerning Christ's coming and the rapture, or being raptured to him, don't be deceived. That won't happen until the rapture happens first. Makes absolutely no sense. By the way, that Greek word apostasia is never used for about 500 years on both sides of when Paul wrote that, of physical, spatial departure. It's used in the Bible in the Septuagint, the Old Testament translation of the Greek. It was translated in the Greek called the Septuagint. It's used of spiritual or physical, I'm sorry, spiritual or political revolt. It's only used one other time, apostasia, in the New Testament, and it's when Paul in Acts 21 is being accused of causing the Jews to forsake the law of Moses, forsake. So that's why virtually pretty much all the translations translate it fallen away or apostasy or rebellion, never rapture. And a couple translations translated departure but the term was never used of a physical, spatial departure in biblical times, okay? But I was expecting Tim, uh, uh, Thomas Ice to come up with a, a better verse, one that would be maybe more of a challenge. 
but one of the things that's used the most, and this is probably used most by my pre-trib brethren, and that is, we're not appointed to the wrath of God, and there's wrath during the tribulation period. And I scratch my head. Because there's wrath right now. In Romans 1.18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men. Right now, it says, Does God spare us from his wrath now? Yes. What did God do with the, his people during the plagues of Egypt? When there was darkness on Pharaoh's kingdom, he gave them what? Light. Who gets the boils in the bowl judgments in Revelation 16 that we've been studying last week? Who got the boils? Those who have the what? Mark of the beast. The darkness that falls right now, it falls on the beast throne. Amen? We could spend a whole service easy. I've done that before. Just looking at how selective the judgment is during the book of Revelation and how it never falls on believers. Now, believers are warned not to go back to the world and reject Christ, or they could take God's wrath, but that's true today too. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, not to be partakers with the children of disobedience of God's wrath, because we're children of light, not to go back. And in Revelation chapter 18, I think around verse 4, it says, come out of her, I mean Babylon, my people, lest you partake of her sins and her plagues. So as long as you continue to follow Christ, you're fine. In fact, I love this. Listen to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter in your rooms. Remember there was light in Israel's dwellings, or I should say the Hebrews' dwellings? Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close the doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. Indignation is wrath. Until it runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place to punish, that's wrath, the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will be revealed for her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. And that's in the context of what we call the mini-apocalypse in Isaiah. The mini-apocalypse, chapter 25, 24, in Isaiah, talks about the tribulation period and God, God's judgment. It talks, it's like reading Matthew 24 or Revelation, uh, just like a different version. It's pre mid and post tribbers call it the mini-apocalypse. And in light of that, guess what? He's going to protect us from his indignation, amen? Just like he protected the Israelites. And by the way, I have the Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bible. And I looked at what he said about that verse. I was curious. And he said, he talks about the Christians that are alive at that time will be spared God's wrath. Amen, Tim. So quit scaring people and saying, God would never let you go through tribulation because you'd be, you're not appointed to wrath. Well, wait a minute. The Christians that are alive on the earth at that time are spared God's wrath. We don't have to worry about it, amen? That's because sometimes what tri pre-trib leaders do is they use they confuse tribulation and wrath. Christians are appointed to what? Tribulation, amen? Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer or take courage because I have overcome the world. The same Paul that says in 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 that we're not appointed to God's wrath says in chapter 3 that we're appointed to tribulation. He talks about these afflictions to wherein to you are appointed. In the Greek word there's lipsis, talking about tribulation. You see. Now, as it gets darker and darker in the world, we're to get brighter and brighter for Jesus. In fact, Proverbs 4.18 says, the, listen to this, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Don't you love that? I love that, man. That means as the world gets darker and darker, we get like, we're like the full dawn. We get brighter and brighter until the full day. And I love that, the full day, that's when the sh sun is shining at its greatest. That's what it's, our lives are like. And by the way, that fits really nicely with uh, other passages. Jesus in Matthew 5, 14 says, You are the light of the world. That's you guys. That's me. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. He warned us not to stick our light under a bushel because it does no good. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, it says, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and perverted generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You guys, we're supposed to shine like stars. We're supposed to let our light shine. I had a whole message called Avoiding Solar and Lunar Eclipses. And there's a difference. 
okay? In one eclipse, it's when the world gets between, I'm sorry, when the world gets between the sun and the moon, right? And we're the moon. We're called the, we're supposed to shine like the full moon according to Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry, according to the Song of Solomon. But when you let the world get between you and Jesus, you're not going to shine. There's going to be an eclipse. Don't let the, put the world before Jesus, amen? Put Jesus first. There's another, there's two eclipses. There's another kind too. It's when you get between you, Christians, or I should say it's when the moon gets between the sun and the world. And then when the moon blocks the sun's light, the world can't get it. Don't you get between the world and Jesus. Jesus is called the son of righteousness who comes with healing in his wings. Don't be a bad example. Don't let people say, I'm not following Jesus. Do you see that guy claims to be a Christian and he stopped following Jesus? He gets drunk and everything. He says he's a Christian and they turned off with the gospel message. Don't do that. Amen? Shine the light of Jesus. Let it shine. Amen? Don't let Satan blow it out. Amen? <laughs> Don't let, remember that? You learned that when you were kids, some of you? The Bible says that we are living letters, living epistles read of men. We're living letters, living epistles read of men. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's talking about the Holy Spirit writing in our hearts God's gospel, His word. And you're a letter. And we talk about how you could be the only gospel, and you will be the only gospel that some people will read. Amen? You'll be the only gospel that some people will read. What, what's your gospel account? There's a gospel according to Matthew, gospel according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. Right? What's the gospel according to, huh? I'm not going to pick anyone out. I see a lot of really nice gospel accounts here, by the way, in this fellowship that bless my heart. That, man, I love the way people shine the light of Jesus here and just love Jesus and, and, and share him with their example in word and deed. You want to make sure you're shining the light of Jesus. Amen. If you're not, say, Lord, help me to be a better example, a better light. If you're trusting Jesus, there's no condemnation in Jesus. Amen. But he does want us to shine brighter. Amen. The Bible says uh, that we're read of men. And keep in mind, people are looking at our lives. And we need to make sure that we're giving them light. How do we give them light? The Bible says that God's word, the entrance of his word is light. You share God's word with them. Amen? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that believes in me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 18. I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 12. So you share Jesus with him. Amen? They knew who God is. He's God in the flesh. He's, that's the message we share is Christ crucified. Amen. What he did for us on, on the cross and how he rose again and how we're, we shine the light on the human nature that we're sinners. You share Jesus, man. You share God's word. You share his law. And they realize, wow, I'm a sinner. And they realize they need Jesus. I apologize. Jojo was getting ready for communion. See, I'm going to hear about that later. You'll say, Dad, you owe me five bucks in illustration. You know, you need to say you use me twice, actually. That's the bad deal. Okay. Yeah, so it'll be ten. <laughs> the mathematician over here. <laughs> uh, but guys, we have a responsibility, man. And, and I want us to take it. We need to take it. God wants us. I'm just telling you what he says. He wants me. He wants you to take this seriously. We live in California. California affects the rest of the nation, which affects the rest of the world. I believe God had me born here in Simi Valley for a reason. And I'm not leaving until God tells me to leave because he put me on the front lines. He put you on the front lines. At least for now you are. And we have a chance and opportunity to speak light into a culture that governs the rest of the world. And we have an opportunity to get the gospel in there. Amen. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Amen. Being wise about how we go about it. But we have God's grace. We have his protection. Amen. He doesn't just give us his word. He gives us his protection. Not one hair on our head will perish. Even if you lose your head, you're not going to lose your hair because you're going to get back at the resurrection and then some. Okay? And it's going to be permanent hair. You won't need that so-called permanent dye. It's all going to be great, you know? So we just wait on Jesus and continue to follow him and continue to love him and exalt and honor him. Now, and I love it because I was talking to Mark back there, Mark Hunter, great brother. We went hiking the other day, and my wife's uh, brother, uh, brother, brother, and he was like, he had some interesting questions and talks, and we 
And he was saying, it's a mystery. How does it, like every eye is going to see him. He goes, that's a mystery how every eye is going to see him. I thought, yeah, it is a mystery in some ways. But I thought also it's going to be really amazing because think of what it's like. Because at the seventh bowl is when Jesus comes back. We're at the fifth bowl right now. What's it like in the world? It's totally what? Dark. In fact, look at Revelation now again, chapter 16. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of the what? Pain. Remember, I was mentioning in Exodus, it was a darkness that could be felt. That's what I'm saying right here. Usually darkness doesn't cause physical pain. This darkness brings pain. And guess what? What's hell like? Jesus said in Matthew 8, 12, he talked about uh, there would be weeping, uh, uh, they'd be cast into outer darkness, and there'd be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's heavy. And he said that over and over again. It's also Matthew 22 in various passages where he described hell as uh, outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when you think about it, right here, there's darkness. And there's what? The gnawing of their tongues because of pain. Biting your tongue? Remember, the, you ever see the old westerns, man, and they're like trying to take a bullet out, right? They have the guy bite something really hard. The pain is so intense that they're biting their tongues to try to, you know, relocate it to, so they don't have to focus on it, you know? And that's gnarly. So it shows me it's a darkness that could be felt, and it hurts really bad. That's crazy. And by the way, people sometimes say, hell is on earth. And sometimes we correct them, and we're right to correct them and say, no, it's far worse. But guess what? I, I say, you know what? There's a little bit of hell on earth because hell is eternal separation from God. And if you're separated from God right now, that's a little taste of hell. The Bible says in Hebrews 6 about tasting the powers of the ages to come, re meaning heaven. You can have a taste of heaven and fellowship, the sweetness of God's spirit, the joy of the Lord, the fruit of the spirit. But people get a little taste of hell here. But at the very end of the tribulation, they're getting a much bigger taste of hell. There's the darkness they can feel, and they're already gnawing their tongues. That's crazy. But you know what? It's going to be so dark. And that's why every eye will see him. One reason, I don't want to say the only reason, every eye will see him, because it's going to be so dark. And Jesus said when he returns, it'll be like what? lightning shining from the east to the west. Amen? And that it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that he's coming with his mighty angels and flaming fire. <sighs> and not just them. It says that he, when John saw him, looked like the sun shining at noonday. And it says, Jesus says when we, he comes back, we'll be resurrected and we will shine like the sun. Think what that's going to look like, guys, when he comes back with us and with the holy angels in flaming fire, every eye will see him. It's going to be so powerful at that time. And in fact, it says in 2 Peter 1.19, So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Jesus Christ is coming back again. And it's going to be a glorious day, amen. And just like all these other prophecies that have come to pass, have come to pass, we still await these end time prophecies. And just like these others came to pass, they're coming to pass. And if you're trusting Jesus, guess what? You're going to be caught up to meet him in the air if you're alive. If you died before he comes back, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. You'll be risen before the rapture. Right before the rapture, you'll be raised. He'll bring with him our loved ones, those who are dead in Christ, and we'll meet them in the air. And we'll shine like lightning. He'll shine like lightning from the east and the west. He'll stand on his feet on the Mount of Olives. He'll establish his thousand-year kingdom. Amen. And it says, after that, he'll, create a new, he'll bring down new Jerusalem. And it says there'll be no need of the sun anymore because it says the, that God himself, and it says the Lamb will be the light of the kingdom. And the gates of new Jerusalem will never be closed. They'll be open forever. I am so glad Jesus did not take a shortcut. Amen. He wants you to be blessed in your life. Don't take a shortcut. Put Jesus first, amen? Don't go back to the world system. Don't be, as the Bible warned, like the dog that goes back to its vomit. Okay? Or the pig back to after it was washed to its wallowing in the mire. Don't do that, man. It's a dead-end street. 
you'll invite the wrath of God. If you don't know Jesus Christ right now, you have a choice. God, Jesus, or Satan. Jesus in heaven, eternal life, or Satan in hell and eternal darkness. Take your pick. To me, it's an easy decision. Jesus said, he that's not with me is against me. You're either for Christ or you're against Christ. Which is it? Which is it? Why would you reject the greatest gift you could ever have, knowing that if you reject it, you're separated from him forever and ever? I encourage you right now. You say, Joe, I want to follow Christ. I just don't have the strength. You're right. You don't have the strength. None of us have the strength. You have to admit you're a sinner and admit you don't have the strength and admit you're a sinner and say, God, have mercy on me. And understand that Jesus died for your sins to pay for them and that he'll give you the strength to live the life he's called you to live. It's about trust. You have to trust that he'll forgive you and he will. He's promised it. God never lies. You have to trust that he'll also give you the strength to live the Christian walk because he lives it through you, amen? And he's promised to do so. All you have to do is surrender to him, amen? So just say, God, have mercy on me. Just in your heart, if you don't know Jesus, say, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Just cry out to him right now and say, save me from the wrath to come. I believe that Jesus died and rose again and conquered death. And you'll have eternal life. I wish I could say it a thousand times better. I don't know how to make it more clear. You just cry out to God and give you his message, but you need to embrace Jesus Christ right now as your Lord and Savior or you have an eternal future without him. And if you're embracing Jesus, don't be a compromiser, amen? Keep putting Jesus first, amen? Let's take a stand on biblical truth and do it in love, amen? Praise God. Can we all please stand? We're going to pass out the cup and the bread. Let's prepare our hearts for communion.